got a lot to talk about today. I promised Cindy I'd go fast um, and uh, not get too hung up. Some of the things we'll be discussing is uh, nuclear power in the United States, just the general overview. Uh, for those of you who, who uh, cut classes in, in high school or college, we're going to talk a little bit about boiling water reactors and some nuclear design concepts. I promise there will be, uh, there probably won't be a, a, a quiz. Uh, we'll talk about Fukushima and what actually happened there, at least the way we understand it right now. Um, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about Pilgrim Station. Uh, I know that's a local plant, how it's different than Fukushima, uh, and certainly we believe safer than Fukushima. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the industry is responding to Fukushima. And finally, we'll be talking um, about one of the, uh, the, the difficult things for nuclear power plants today is spent fuel storage and, and how we're going to deal with that. A uh, little bit about the company. I work for Entergy. Uh, we are an integrated energy company. Uh, we, we are primarily engaged in, a, in a generating electricity. We generate about 30,000 megawatts of electricity. Uh, we own 11 nuclear power plants. We are the second largest nuclear operator uh, in the United States. We have annual revenues in the neighborhood of about $10 billion and about 15,000 employees. Uh, what perhaps makes Entergy somewhat unique is Entergy is, is very, very aggressive in supporting climate change. Uh, rather than waiting for the government to force corporations uh, to reduce their emissions, uh, Entergy already has one of the lowest CO2 emissions rates in the country. We're the fifth um, best in the, in the entire United States. And we've actually, uh, on our second commitment to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions to 20% below our 2000 emissions in the period of 2006 to 2010, and we've accomplished that. Our, our CEO is very, very, very supportive of climate change. One of the reasons we can do that is a vast part of our, of our portfolio are nuclear power plants. There are about, uh, they're not about, there are 104 operating nuclear power plants uh, in the United States today. Um, as you can see, many of these plants are located in their major population areas, and people tend to get excited about that in New York, and then we get a little excited about that in Boston. Unfortunately, you need a power plant where the load is. If you don't have a power plant where the load is, you need transmission uh, that's not necessarily efficient, and that transmission infrastructure when these plants were being built, quite honestly, was not there. And there's questions whether it's actually even there today. Um, but again, we sometimes feel that nuclear is a local issue here, here in the Boston area, or certainly in the New York area. But places like Washington, D.C., Miami, Chicago, all have nuclear power plants in the, in the uh, vicinity. And in fact, it's been estimated that about 30% of the U.S. population lives within about th uh, 50 miles of a nuclear power plant. So, so the location of nuclear plants is not just a New England or, or a New York uh, issue. There are people who will tell you that nuclear power is not a, um, a low emissions type of generating source. When you look at the entire f uh, life cycle, that means you know, uh, the emissions uh, that, that you have to uh, release to, to mine the steel, to mine the uranium, to build the plants. Um, but on a per gigawatt hour basis, nuclear power plants put out a lot of money. Uh, I'm sorry, not a lot of money, poor choice of words. Um, <laughs> a lot of electricity. <laughs> I got to read my notes better. A um, <laughs> lot, lot of a lot of electricity, and on a comparable basis, they're very, very comparable in, in, in life cycle emissions um, to hydro, geothermal, and wind, and and they're actually better than solar. So they are certainly certainly low emission source of energy. Um, nuclear power has some of the lowest production costs, somewhere in the neighborhood of a, a, of a two and a half cents. Um, significantly better than the, uh, the, uh, the other fossil uh, plants that are out there right now. And that's a direct impact. Whether, whether you buy power from uh, the Pilgrim Station or any of, the, of, any of the, uh, the plants in New England, um, it's a direct benefit to us because the power is available to the grid and, and typically at, at those lower prices. But let's take a, a closer look in New England. Uh, in 2009, the combined nuclear output, so I'm talking about Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee, Seabrook, and Millstone, um, nuclear power accounted for 30% of the, uh, of the uh, generation in the, uh, in the entire New England area. Um, that is significantly uh, far ahead of hydro, which was the second most non-emitting source, about 8%. So nuclear power is, is, is the largest low emission source of power that we currently have uh, in New England right now. Now, 
Let's talk about this a little bit. Let's bring it at home, a, little, a little closer to home. Let's talk about Pilgrim. Pilgrim in 2010 operated at about a 95% capacity factor. That means it operated at 100% power for 95% of all the hours that were there. That, that is a, an excellent availability factor. Uh, Pilgrim generated about 6 million, just under 6 million megawatt hours in 2010. If Pilgrim wasn't there, because Pilgrim's a base load unit, you would probably have to replace that with a fossil unit. If we replaced it with a coal plant, that coal plant in terms of CO2 emissions would have put out about 672 tons of carbon dioxide an hour, or about 6 million tons of carbon dioxide over the entire year. Now, we probably realistically wouldn't replace Pilgrim with coal. It would probably be in New England a gas-fired unit. But even that gas-fired unit would put out, on average, about 337 tons of CO2 an hour, or about 3 million tons um, on, a, on an annual basis. But you know, what, what's a ton of CO2 look like? You know, it's kind of hard. It's an, it's an oblique thought. So what we did is um, we looked up Google, and we asked Google, what does an African elephant weigh? We all have seen African elephants. We can visualize that. African elephant weighs about 4.6 tons. If we replaced it with, if we replaced Pilgrim with that coal unit and we put everything in terms of elephants, okay, the coal plant would have been producing out of the stack about 147 elephants every hour. Gas plant somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, I think it was, uh, I don't know, 73 elephants every hour. Okay, so what's that look like on an annual basis? Well, if you do the math, and um, well, I'll, I'll let you do the math, but the bottom line is it's a lot of elephants, <laughs> okay? So just to put it in perspective, I mean, one of the big benefits of nuclear power is the fact that it's a low emission source. All right, let's move on to uh, Fukushima and some basic concepts about boiling water reactor design. We have a simple schematic here of a boiling water reactor. The Fukushima reactors were called boiling water reactors. And that's because we actually allow the water in the reactor vessel to boil to turn into steam before we bring that steam over to the turbine section. And in fact, uh, if you look at this picture, and, and on your right side, you see the turbine building, the condenser, the pumps. That could be any power plant. That doesn't have to be a nuclear power plant. That any steam-fired plant would have those same components. You, you know, I could bring you into the plant, and it would look identical. The thing that differentiates the nuclear plant is on the left. And that's our reactor building and the reactor vessel and the reactor core. So let's take a closer look at that. Okay, uh, what you're seeing there is the reactor building secondary containment. We have primary and secondary containment. <coughs> secondary containment is the outside building. Reactor core, and I'll show you pictures of reactor core in a little minute. That's the that in a minute. That's the actual fuel that's inside the reactor vessel. We have the reactor pressure vessel itself. And that's a steel structure. It's in the neighborhood of five inches thick all around. We have the containment dry well. Inside the containment dry well, there's an inner liner. And it's shown up. I don't, I don't think it shows up too good there, that, that red on the inside. That's a five inch, roughly, it varies between five eighths of an inch and five inch thick steel inner liner, backed up by about five feet of concrete. And it's actually a building, to put it in, uh, to put it in perspective, when we're in refueling outages, we have people actually inside that inverted light bulb structure. It's a building surrounded by the other building. Uh, we have a torus or a suppression chamber. That's the bottom. And in case there was ever a leak, and this is going to be important when we talk about Fukushima, what's supposed to happen is the steam or the water is supposed to be directed into the torus. The torus will quench the steam back into water. And then there are pumps that can pump that water back into the reactor vessel to keep the reactor fuel cool uh, when, it, when it's shut down. A little more uh, specific view, you can get a cutaway view of the boiling water reactor design. And this is a, um, they call it a, a, a Mark I uh, type of containment. And it is similar to the containment that we saw in, uh, in Fukushima. This is a, uh, a mock-up of a nuclear fuel assembly. Everybody, the news refers to the reactor core. The reactor core actually consists of about, in, at Pilgrim anyhow, 540 of these assemblies. Uh, these assemblies are about 12 feet tall. They contain anywhere from 60 to probably 100 individual tubes. And inside those individual tubes are the uh, uranium pellets. And in fact, you can, you can see them there. And one of the concepts that we use in nuclear is a concept called defense in depth. 
the really nasty stuff, the, the highly radioactive stuff, is contained inside those pellets once those pellets are irradiated. And the goal is to make sure that under the most adverse condition, those radionuclides stay inside those pellets. They're protected by the zirconium or the tubes on the outside. If those were to fail, you have the reactor vessel that I showed you. If the reactor vessel were to fail, you have the primary containment. And if the primary containment were to fail, you have the second building, the secondary containment. So we kind of call that defense in depth. Now, armed with that information, let's take a look at what actually happened at Fukushima. And I need to point out, and this is very, very important, what we're going to talk about now is based on our current understanding of what happened at Fukushima. We're getting information in every single day. Um, the information changes sometimes day to day. It, sometimes it's contradictory to what we had heard before. And the reality is it's probably going to be many months if not years before we have a full understanding of exactly what happened at Fukushima. So this is how we understand it today. Seems to make sense, um, but again, this is all subject to, to change as, as we go through this. Uh, let me back up for a second. At Fukushima, units one, two, and three were in operation. Four, five, and six were shut down for refueling. Okay, that's, uh, that was the, uh, the starting point. Uh, the earthquake happened offshore. We've all seen the news report, uh, broadcasts, and we, we've heard that on March 11th. And first thing that happened is at about 2.40, 2.45 in the afternoon, the earthquake hit. The power grid in Japan failed. In other words, there was no more power on the grid. Um, but from the Fukushima perspective, the nuclear reactors shut down. They did what they were supposed to do. They sensed there was no power on the grid, so for safety, they automatically called a scram. The control rods got inserted. The reactor shut down. There was no more chain reaction going on. Very important concept here. Um, the emergency diesel generators started, which the plant had, and the purpose of those emergency diesel generators was to provide power to the cooling pumps that circulated water in the reactor core to keep the reactor core cool. Now, important concept here. I told you the nuclear reaction shut down, and indeed it did. But once the reactor shuts down, that core is still very hot, and it still generates what we call decay heat for many, many, many days. Um, and that's the radionuclides going through their process. So you need to be able to cool the core even though the reactor is shut down. And that's, that's, that's uh, very important to understand. Re earthquake hit, reactor shut down, core was being cooled, everything was fine. 